And now, Father, as we again thank you for these 48 years Amen. and your mercy that you have shown and um, for the mercy that we still need you to show. Hear our cry. Speak to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. A lady was getting dressed to go out to an event with her husband. And while she was getting ready, her husband rushed in and said, we have a problem. We're not going to be able to go to our event. She says, well, what do you mean? We're not going to be able to go. He says, well, the car is not working. The car is broken. She says, well, what happened with the car? He said, there's water in the carburetor, and so the car won't start. She said, what do you mean there's water in the carburetor? You know nothing about cars. How do you know there's water in the carburetor? I'm telling you, we're not going to be able to go anywhere. I can tell you now, it won't start because there's water in the carburetor. She said, where's the car? He said, at the bottom of the swimming pool, so there's water <laughs> in the carburetor. Sometimes things are actually worse than we want to admit. Uh, we go around and we'll say, well, I'm okay, but things are worse than we're willing to admit. Trying to make it, but they're a lot worse than that. They're worse than we're wanting to admit. Two weeks ago, I introduced a unique story of Jesus sending his disciples across the Sea of Galilee. We explain why it's a unique story. Because it's found in all four of the Gospels. That's not normal. The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, share the same stories, just through the perspective of the different author. John does not do that. John has a whole different purpose of evangelism, so John does not share the stories of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, for the most part. But he does share this one. This was so important that John wanted to make sure he got in on the action of the crossing of the Sea of Galilee. If you recall, Jesus told his disciples to go to the other side. When Matthew tells the story, he tells more of the story than any of the others. He gives us more data, more information than Mark and Luke and John. Same story, but with more information. He tells us in Matthew chapter 20, 14, verse 22, that Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. They weren't volunteering to get in the boat. He had to force them to get in the boat. He had to convince them, one version says, to get into the boat. They didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave for two reasons. They didn't want to leave Jesus, but they knew the weather forecast wasn't in their favor. These are guys who lived on the water. These were fishermen. They lived on the Sea of Galilee, and they knew uh, things look shaky. And uh, this is not a good time to go, especially when we're going to go later in the evening. It, it, it's not a good time, so Jesus had to force them out. So he makes them get in the boat and go to the other side. Sometimes God will put you in challenging situations that you can't avoid because he's going to force it on you. He made them go. As you remember the story, as they were going, when they got to the middle, they hit this weather storm. They hit the weather storm, and when they hit this weather storm, it says that they were battered by the waves in verse 24, for the wind was contrary. In other words, the wind was blocking them to get where they were told to go. 
So they were told to go here, but the wind was blowing here, so they couldn't get there because they were being resisted. Amen. And the resistance was outside of their control. The wind was contrary to them. As you recall, not only that, but it was the fourth watch of the night. That's 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So they're trying to make it in darkness. They can't see. So they've been forced to go where they don't want to go. They're being blocked to get there by circumstances out of their control. It's dark because they've been out there so long now. Night is set in and the wind is so contrary. They've been out there for hours trying to make it. So that means they're tired. Then on top of all of that, we're told that the disciples saw Jesus, verse 26, walking on the sea and they were terrified. It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. So now they see somebody walking on the water in the dark while they're tired because they've been out there all day in a place they didn't want to be in the first place. So they are terrified. Things have gone from bad to worse. Then Jesus comes and he says in verse 27, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Some of the versions say, be of good cheer. In other words, I want you to rejoice in your bad situation. Amen. You don't want to be here. The weather is against you. You're tired. It's dark. It looks like a ghost Casper, the unfriendly ghost, is all up on you. And I want you to rejoice. Because I'm in charge of this situation. This bad situation that you're in, I'm here. Do not be afraid. We're told that Jesus got to them walking on the water. So I want to talk to you today, me today, and us today about you starting to walk on water. I want to create some water walkers today. Because now we come to the part of the story that Luke and Mark and John don't talk about, but Matthew does. We're told in verse 28, Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Peter says, Lord, I heard what you just said. If it is you, if I'm really hearing from you, I want you to tell me to come to join you in a stormy situation. Amen. The storm has not subsided yet. The winds are still blowing. Jesus has come to them on top of the problem because the problem has not yet been solved of their fear, their storm, all of the negative things are still right in front of them and Jesus comes to them on the problem. They didn't recognize him because they weren't looking for him. See, because a lot of times when you're in a stormy situation, you are looking for Jesus because you've been so overwhelmed by the presence of the storm and the negative circumstances that it's causing you consternation, fear, anxiety. But Peter is different. Peter says, I heard what you just said. You said, take carriage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Amen. So I want you to tell me to join you on top of the problem. Because Jesus came to them on top of the problem. I'm with 11 other guys who are terrified. I'm with my peeps. And they're scared to death because we're in this bad situation, but you're walking on top of it. I want to hang out with you on top of it rather than them who are succumbing to it. 
but I'm not going to do that unless you tell me I can. So he says, bid me, command me to come to you on the water. So if you're going to start walking on water, the first thing you got to do is ask permission. He says, bid me come to you. Because if you try to walk on water and it hasn't been okayed, you're going to drown. He asked permission to walk on top of a problem. He's asking for, watch this, a personal word to him. Jesus has given a general word to all. He says to all of them, be not afraid, it is I. He tells that to everybody. Peter says, I don't just want a general word, I want you to bid me to come. Let's review. The Bible is graphe, means the writings. What is written in this book or on your device, the Word of God, is graphe. It's what is written. If it's sitting on your shelf, if it's sitting on the coffee table, whether it's closed or open, it is the written Word of God, and that is the graphe. Then there is the logos. The logos is the content and meaning of what is written. Graphe is the fact that it's written. Logos is what is written, what it says, and what it means. So there is graphe, there is logos, and then there is rhema. Rhema is a personal word. It is a word with your name on it. It is a specific word to you. If you hold the word of God, you've got graphe. If you read it and seek to understand it, you're now dealing with logos. But when you need to hear something with your name on it, that's rhema. Peter says, I want rhema. I want you to bid me to, I ain't talking about what you say to them. I want you to bid me to come and walk on water. So he makes a personal request for Jesus to give him a personal okay for him to operate in the supernatural. And he's the only one who made the request. There are only two people who have ever walked on water in the Bible. Jesus and Peter. Nobody else has ever walked on water. But nobody else has ever requested it. He specifically asks, bid me come to you, I want to walk on water. So the question is, what does it mean to walk on water? Remember, the waves are billowing because of the wind. It's a stormy situation. It's so much that they're scared, and many of them are professional fishermen, so for them to be scared, it really must be bad. So the water was a tumultuous situation created by the wind that brought a threat to their well-being. So whenever you have a situation in your life that is tumultuous, that threatens your well-being, and you know it's controlling your emotions because like them, you're terrified about the repercussions. Whenever all of that happens, that is your water. Walking on water means you're on top of it. It's not swallowing you. Water means that even in the turmoil of what's going on, the billows, the waves, the, the threats, the, all of the things that are seeking to overwhelm you, even in the midst of that, Jesus bid me to walk on it like you walking on it, to not drown in it like you're not drowning in it, to not be terrified by it like you're not terrified by it. Tell me to come. I ask for permission. So he makes a prayer request. We'll call it that because he's asking for permission. Amen. Jesus gives him a one word permission because he says in verse 28, 29, come. One word, come. 
The first thing you've got to do if you're going to walk on your circumstance and not drown in them is to ask permission to enter into the realm of the supernatural because the natural is sucking you under. Once you ask permission, you must listen for a response because he didn't do anything till he heard come. But if you're in a tumultuous situation, you have to be close enough to Jesus to hear the response. Because if Jesus and you aren't close, even if he says come, you won't hear it. But he heard Jesus say come in the turmoil. So you make the request and then you listen for the rhema word where he tells you what to do. I am speaking to you today from graphe, from what's written in the Word. I'm trying to explain what it means. That's logos. But what you need for your turmoil is rhema. So you want to ask God, tell me something about what I should do in my situation because everybody's is different. Oh, we all share the same problem. They just come in different wrappings. So in the turmoil that they can do nothing about, he says, give me permission. Let me hear what you want me to do. Come, Peter. Because the word of God, Rhema, when it is spoken, has embedded power in it. When, when Jesus says come, it's like when God says, let there be light, and there was light. The embedded light was in the command for light. God didn't have to say, let there be light and go find a bulb. In other words, once God says something, his answer is embedded in his statement. That's why the word of God is powerful. But now we're talking about the word of God for you personally, not just the sermon generally. So I'm speaking the sermon generally, but there's somebody here in a tumultuous situation who needs to hear a personal word. What do you want me to do in my unique situation? Which is the job of the Holy Spirit to personalize the Logos to your circumstance. But you've got to be close enough to hear him say, come. So the first thing you've got to do is make the request. Second thing you've got to do is listen for the response. But then there's something else you've got to do because it says in verse 29, and Peter got out of the boat. You can't make your request, hear the response, and stay where you are. He got out of the boat. Jesus said, come, and he didn't stay. See, because you can hear what God says and not move on it. But if you don't move on it, what he says will lie dormant, not because his statement was dormant, but because there wasn't a response. So he had to get out of the boat. So if you're going to walk on water, you must be willing to leave your comfort zone. Walking on water means you got to take a risk. But it's a calculated risk because you've asked permission and you've heard from heaven. But you must be willing to take the risk. Now, Peter is the only one willing to take this risk. There's 12 people in this boat. 11 of them say, I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> they don't even make the request. So we can have a bunch of people right now in the same situation, but only one person see a miracle. Amen. Only one person sees the supernatural, even though we may all be in the same boat. We didn't come over here in different ships, but we're in the same boat now. And if you're in that boat, and you got other people in that boat, and the boat is full of Christians. The disciples are in the boat with him. He got James and John and Matthew and he got, he's, got, he's, got, he's got the other disciples. They're Christians too. But just because you saved doesn't mean that you're willing to leave the boat. 
Just because you're on your way to heaven doesn't mean you're willing to take the risk of faith. Only one did it. And that's why only one person is walking on water. But what God wants to raise up in our lives personally and in us collectively are water walkers. People who will take risk on the supernatural. He gets out of the boat. And Peter joins Jesus walking on the problem that was causing them to be terrified. See, one of the ways you know you're walking with Jesus is that the circumstances are no longer calling the shots even though they haven't changed. The circumstances haven't changed. You'll see that in a moment. They're still in stormy weather. Nothing has changed except he's walking on it. It's not walking on him. And to do that sometimes, you got to leave the crowd behind. The folks who don't want to leave the boat because they've been in the boat too long. They've been in their comfort zone too long. See, in order for a turtle to go somewhere, it's got to stick its neck out first. A turtle doesn't stick its neck out, it's not moving. Only when it sticks its neck out and until you're willing to take the risk of faith based on the request that has been responded to, you'll never walk on water. You'll never experience the supernatural. You'll just listen to somebody else tell you about theirs. Because we know about Peter's. Because he walked on water. He walked on the circumstance that was threatening his well-being. So Peter is walking on water now. He walked on the water and came to Jesus. He got out of the boat. So the question is, what boat do you need to get out of? Is it the boat of self-pity? Is it the boat of defeat? Is it the boat of depression? Is it the boat of throwing in the towel? What, what is the boat? And the water won't settle down and the wind keeps blowing and you're scared and Jesus is a ghost to you. His reality is not real and so you don't even bother to request or the request is stop the wind and the wave. That is, change my situation, not show me how I can walk on it. See, that's a different request. See, everybody wants the wind to stop, the waves to calm down. In other words, we want the turmoil to stop. And God may want to show you what it is to walk on it when it doesn't stop or until it stops. So Peter's now walking on water. Things are looking good for the boy because now he's no longer controlled by the circumstances even though the circumstances have not changed yet. Verse 30. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Let me, I need to read that slow. <laughs> but seeing the wind, he became frightened, beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Okay, phrase by phrase. Seeing the wind. Homeboy has already seen the wind. The reason why they've been out there all night is because of the wind. This isn't new wind. And by, and by the way, how do you see wind? You don't see air blowing, you see what the blowing air does. You know, we had some blowing air yesterday, knocked over a tree that fell on a car. Because you know what the wind is doing by the effect that the wind is having. 
That's how you see when. It says, seeing the when that he's already seen. So if he's already seen the when, why is he telling us that he's now seeing the when? Because when he saw Jesus, the wind that he was seeing no longer was carrying the authority over his life. Let me say it another way. When the spiritual took over, the physical dissipated. When he saw Jesus when he was in the boat and asked him to let him walk on water out of the boat, his total focus was on what Jesus had to say and not the wind. But once he got out that boat, and now his security was gone. See, the boat gave you a certain level. See, there was a little bit of security in the boat. First of all, you got the wood around you. You're at least in something. And then you got 11 other homeboys screaming with you. So at least... If you're going to die, you ain't going to die by yourself. You know, you, you got some company. You got some company. But now he's out there on the water by himself, and the wind looks different now. Same wind, different effect. Seeing the wind, he is now afraid. He was already afraid because we, we talked about the fact he was afraid before they saw Jesus. Then he changed his focus, asked could he walk on the problem. He's walking on the problem, but the wind has now become more real because he's standing on top of water. And he's seeing all these waves bouncing all over the place because the storm is still raging and he is terrified. Amen. Why is he terrified? His focus changed. He's walking on water because he shifted from the wind to Jesus. But now it shifts, so now he sees the wind and not Jesus. Next line. He began to sink. How do you begin to sink? I'll wait. There's no such thing as beginning to sink. If you step in water, bloop, you're going down. He's progressively sinking. He's sinking in stages because he begins to sink. He starts sinking. Going down one time. I'm drowning, drowning in the sea of love. You remember, okay. But he's, he's sinking. but he's only beginning to sink. He's starting to sink. His feet are starting to go slowly down in the water. He's beginning to sink. As he's going down in the water, afraid because his focus is now on the wind and not the command he was given by the Lord, the problem that he was walking on is now about to walk on him. Because the problem didn't change. The wind is still tumultuous. But now he's beginning to slowly go under. And the further he is going down, his focus reshifts. Lord, save me. That's prayer number two. <laughs> prayer number one is, let me come. Prayer number two, help! <laughs> and the difference between the two prayers was focus. Amen. What he was looking at. He was looking at Jesus, so he got out the boat. He stopped looking at Jesus, he began to sink. He looked back at Jesus, it says, and the Lord reached down and grabbed him. Let me, let me put it another way. When his five senses took over his sixth sense, the five senses dominated his life. When the sixth sense took over the five senses. The sixth sense dominated his life because if you are a Christian, you have six senses, not five. 
five senses, you know, our ability to, to hear and our ability to touch and feel, all, the five senses allow you to operate in the natural physical realm. That's how we operate in this world. We operate by our five senses. But once you come to Christ, there is a sixth sense. And that is the sense that gives you the ability to pick up on the supernatural. It's the sixth sense. But if you don't know about the sixth sense, and if you don't ever utilize the sixth sense, you won't walk on water. You'll stay in the boat scared even when Jesus says, come and walk on water, because you're not used to doing it. If I told you uh, tomorrow and you're not a runner, tomorrow we're going to run a marathon, 26-mile marathon, you ain't going to make it a block. <laughs> you're certainly not going to make it a mile if you're not in shape. You know what? You got to be trained to run a marathon. You got to be trained to run a marathon. See, if you're not used to using your sixth sense, then when the storm hits, you won't use it because it's not your habit to use it. It is when we learn to operate with the spiritual informing the natural and not the natural informing the spiritual that you get to walk on water. But when the natural informs the spiritual, then you are limited to the natural and you sink because that's what you do in water. You go down. It is the spiritual and that refocus that brought Jesus to save him. Okay, what, what exactly went wrong? Well, he tells us. Because we're told in verse 31, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Oh, now we know what happened. It wasn't the problem of a lack of faith. There was a little faith. And Jesus had said, if you have faith, this grain of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. O oh, ye of little faith, it's the second line. Why did you doubt? So evidently, you can have faith and doubt operating in the same space. Because he tells them you have little faith, but he tells them with the faith you had doubt. Belief and unbelief can occupy the same space. That's why in Mark uh, 9.24, in Mark 9.24, Jesus says, do you believe I can heal? The man said, I believe, but help my unbelief. He says, I believe, but I don't believe. And, and you know what it is to be in that position. I trust God, but I kind of don't. I believe him, but I kind of not sure. I, 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 yeah. He's so high, you can't get over. I got that. He's so low, you can't get under. He's so wide, you can't get around. He's a bomber, Gilead, a bright morning star, rose and shine. I got <laughs> However, in the real world, he says, I believe, but help my unbelief. So evidently, belief and unbelief can occupy the same space. So here it is. When doubt rises, faith shrinks. When faith rises, doubt shrinks. He got out of the boat in faith. So whatever fear that was in the boat lessened because faith grew because he got out the boat. But once he shifted his focus, doubt grew because he was seeing all the winds and the waves. And as doubt grew, Faith lost its clout. Faith lost its juice. Faith couldn't save him because the natural world had become his focus. When the natural world, where the five senses operate, begin to overrule the sixth sense of the spiritual, 
then the circumstances will take over and you will begin to sink. How fast you sink, how quick you sink will be determined by how fast the doubt grows and how fast the faith shrinks. He didn't give up all faith, but he did allow doubt to escalate. And once that happened, the supernatural power and presence left and he began to sink. He began to go down. He says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I called you out here, got you started in a miracle, and now you're losing the juice of the miracle because you shifted your focus. When the storm rages, and it is, and it was, and it will be, where there's turmoil out of your, outside of your capacity to figure out, understand, or change. And you are in the will of God. If you're not in the will of God, you must get in the will of God so you're close enough to God to make contact with God and hear from God when God speaks into your situation. And when he speaks, you must act. Faith without works is dead. When he speaks, you must move. You must leave the boat, which means sometimes leaving your friends, Amen. your Christian friends, because they're going to hang in the boat, which means they're not going to see a miracle. That's why sometimes you have to step out by yourself. When Oakland Bible Fellowship was started, we were a joke to many because we didn't come up through the systems. I had one county commissioner says, uh, uh, you, uh, you, are, um, you are an anomaly because what you're doing, we are not used to. Bible church and this side of town and that kind of thing. But the issue was, were we called to do it? When we had that A-frame building and we needed $200,000 to buy it and we didn't have $2,000 the question was not, first of all, do we have the money, but God, are you telling us to get it? Amen. Once we heard that word, that's when we saw the miracle of the guy who wrote the check for $200,000 so we could get the A-frame building. When they were going to kick us out of the school and the vote was against us and we were, didn't know how we were going to be able to continue to meet as a church. And to make a long story short, God had an accident that kept the people who were against us from getting to the meeting so they couldn't vote against us. We saw the supernatural enter into the natural. It says, then when they, Peter and Jesus, because they, they rolling buddies now, they walking into the boat, according to verse 32, when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. So all this time, the wind has not stopped. It's, it's tumultuous out there, scaring fishermen to death. It says, when they got into the boat, when Jesus, and Jesus didn't just get into the boat, Jesus and Peter got into the boat. So when Jesus got into the boat with the miracle man who walked on water, the wind stopped. And what happened when the wind stopped? Don't miss this lesson. Verse 33. And those who were in the boat worshiped him, worship Jesus. And the Bible says you only, uh, you only worship God. Any other worship is idolatry. So they worship Jesus because Jesus is God. Saying, you are certainly God's son. Okay, let's do a little Bible study. I mentioned this last time. In Mark chapter 6, excuse me, in Mark chapter 4, when Jesus was asleep on the cushion and he said, peace be still, they said, what manner of man is this? That even the winds and the wave obey him. That's in Mark 4. This happens after Mark 4. It's in Mark 6 or Matthew 14. In Matthew 14, they don't say what manner of man is this. They say certainly this is the Son of God. Amen. So they didn't bump Jesus up a notch. 
When he did the first miracle, he's just a unique man. What manner of man is this? Where the winds and the wave obey him. But in Matthew chapter 14, he says, this must certainly be the Son of God. One of the reasons, watch this, that God will allow, create, bring you into turmoil that he doesn't ease is he wants to bump up your understanding of who he is. He wants to bump up your knowledge of who he is. He wants you to see that he operates in a whole different zone and that if you hang with him, you can walk on water with him. And then you can then enter the boat with him to other folk who are scared to death to calm them down when they see your miracle at work in their presence. They get in the boat and they see the supernatural at work. Oh, the Bible is full of folk who took risk, who took risk on God. Rahab took a risk on God. All of Jericho was against God and against Israel. But she said, I'm going to let the spies in, send them out another way. And the spies said, because you have took your bet on God, because she said, I didn't heard about your God, how he opened up the Red Sea, and even though everybody in Jericho is against you, I'm hanging with y'all. And the Bible says when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, there was one piece of the wall left standing, and that was Rahab's house, and her whole family was saved. Esther took a risk on God. When Mordecai said, if you go to the king, you can be used of God to save the people. She said, the king has not called me, and I risk my life to go into the king. Mordecai said, if you don't go, God's going to find somebody else to go. So the question is, do you want to use him? Don't think by your rebellion you're going to get away from the problem. She said, okay, I got the message. If I perish, I perish. And she took a risk on God. And when she took a risk on God, he saved the whole nation of Israel. Daniel took a risk on God. In Daniel chapter 1, he's a teenager. He was told to eat meat offered to idols. He says, I know y'all not going to like this. I know y'all not going to want this, and I'm going to look like the odd man out. But I can't eat meat offered to idols. And when he refused to eat meat and offered to idols, in verse 8, verse 9 says, now God. <laughs> After he made his stand against no everybody else, God stepped in and brought him and made him cream of the crop because he took a risk on God. She, Meshach, Shadrach, and a bad Negro, I mean Abednego, took a risk on God. They said, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to bow before your fiery furnace. And if you're going to throw us in the fire, we're still going to bet on God, even though we're only three people who are going to take a risk on God. They took a risk on God, and the Bible says, and God joined them in the fiery furnace. And he put in three, but there were four, because God loves folk who take risk on him to see the supernatural. We had a man in my ch our church, and I was preaching through the book of Nehemiah. And it talked about how Nehemiah left and rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. He took a risk to go back home to rebuild the walls. He said while he was sitting and listening at the sermon, God gave him a rhema word. The rhema word was you need to leave your job, start your own business, because I have something different for you to do than that nine to five that you've been working on. He couldn't shake it and knew he heard from God. He stepped out, began his his own business. He and his wife came to me a few months ago. Pastor, I just want you to know that because of the new business that I started, when I heard from God, me and my wife can retire early because I took a risk on God when I heard a rhema word. When you listen to a rhema word from God, you can bet on God. You bet on everything else. I didn't see some of you buying lottery tickets. You bet on everything else. Take a risk on God. And if you take a risk on God, 
you'll get the chance to see the supernatural operating in the natural. There's a little girl, and she was blind, and there was a fire in the house, but she couldn't see. She smelled the smoke. She didn't know how close the fire was. The fire trucks were called. They stood outside the window, but she was way up high. They said, little girl, jump, jump. She said, I can't jump, I don't see. I'm blind and I'm scared. But the fire was getting closer. Please, little girl, you gotta jump. We got the net here to catch you. But she said, I'm terrified. I don't wanna take the risk. I'm too scared. They begged her to jump. In a few minutes, she would have been consumed by the smoke and the fire. But after a few moments, there was another voice that came. Darling, this is your daddy. And I'm telling you, girl, jump, because I got my arms open wide, and daddy is here to catch you. I got good news for you. When you hear daddy, it's time to jump. When you hear daddy, it's time to leap because daddy's got his eyes wide open. The Bible says Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith. If he tells you to jump, you better jump because daddy's got his arms wide open. Let's stand to our feet.